Yeah. 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 Hi, Garen. I love the community. All right, Garen. <laughs> You're the school community. That's true. Um, all right, proficiency grading. Right, and I'll just introduce um, this evening's workshop. Um, we are positioned to talk to you about where we're, our work with proficiency grading, as you heard at our last meeting. The community has had some concerns about how that's going. and. Um, We've been working extremely closely with the members of the policy committee, Jim, Pam, and Lou, um, to try to craft and to work collaboratively to bring something to the board that we think will address the community concerns that you're hearing. Um, and so what we have this evening is a presentation. Um, Gary is going to be presenting, and Raph and Richard as well will be, be stepping in. Uh, Garen is the, the leader of the, the middle school, high school, and Raph and Richard have been serving as central office liaisons to this committee, um, as well as myself on this particular issue, so I think they can offer some valuable thoughts as well. Um, policy committee, anything that you want to say to kind of get this launched? Um, no, I don't think so. Let's say dig into it, and we can probably yeah. comment as we go. Yeah, sounds good. But all right. All right. There we go. Um, so I think j just to set the stage a little bit more, I think Lou raised this um, this issue when we met a couple times ago in terms of um, the difference between policy and procedure, and particularly around the grading. And, and you know, a lot of the conversations we've been having have been trying to elevate the policy conversations, but this particular conversation is going to delve a lot into procedures. And, and and I think as Lou noted, this is something that's really important because. A lot of these procedures dictate how these processes happen. So um, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today are different procedures that, that are being proposed to, to make improvements on um, the grading system. So just to orient um, everyone here, I know some of you have already seen this and I've seen this multiple times. Um, just to give you a quick overview on, on the relationship between these three different components. So um, the transcript and the report card and, and our online portal are our, our grade book. Um, so they, they serve really distinctly different purposes, um, and they contain different amounts of information. So, so the audience for, for transcripts, the audience is really external. It's really those colleges and universities and employers, um, whereas the audience for the report card is parents and students. Um, and similarly to, to our online gradebook, um, parents and students as well. And the level of detail really varies transcript has, has a very, very small amount of, of, of information, actually. It's really just the final grade with credit and GPA. Um, whereas a, as we go down this pyramid, you, you'll see we get more and more information. Um, and so we wanted to give this to you just to orient you a little bit, because we're going to be coming back to this numerous times. And some of the things that we're talking about, we're actually going to propose changes at all levels of this hierarchy um, so that we can, we can adjust the system to make it better overall. So as far as the starting point, we've seen this before. Uh, so these are some results from the parent survey and student surveys that I sent out, I guess it's been about a month ago now. And, and what led to those surveys being sent out were concerns that were coming out of students, coming out of parents, coming out of teachers as well, and trying to gauge what are some, what are some updates and adjustments that we need to make um, to the system. And then that's data that the policy committee has used a bit as well to look through how to make some adjustments. Uh, when we looked at the, the grading procedures, where to really change them is to focus on how do we make them make it more understandable to people? How do we make it more useful to people as well? We heard feedback around unable to make good connections between what these standards are saying, what my child is saying about their school experience, and how to help them. So how do we make these things a more useful piece? And then the third thing that really was clear too is what are clear expectations that parents and students can have of the system? What are the expectations around Timing us what expectations you can have around knowing the procedures and how it comes through. Right. So one established practice that we've been working on and, and developing over the last few years is using these four-point rubrics. <coughs> four-point rubric and the 
the plan is to continue to use those four point rubrics on assessments and generating the scores in classes. Um, some of the reasons why are because one, it's an established practice, we've been using it for some time now. Uh, another one is in that established practice, we've generated a lot of these rubrics based on standards. So we have a good body of work that there is still some need to work on, there's still some adjustments, but we have that, that good body of work from teachers to, to continue to come from. And Darren, yeah. in the uh, parent and the student's report, the survey, it showed that people wanted to stay with Yeah, students. thanks. And also they, for that as well, so there was, as far as what came through that people wanted, standards want. So thanks for that, Jim. So what the rubrics look like, again, for those who haven't seen them, this is an example. There's an overall thing, core standard here from the next generation science standards. That's the NGSS. What the anchor standard on top is, within our science department, we've identified core anchor standards that reach across the um, different courses, and one is this anchor standard of explaining. What is that? You can see it with more depth, what it looks like from the NG NGSS, the National um, Next Generation Science Standards, excuse me, and then looking at what would some components be. So the first line around developing a claim, what would that be look like at a beginning level through to approaching proficient and distinguished level. And the way these are, are written is on a developmental continuum. And what we primarily use that is a taxonomy called loose taxonomy, which is looking at what's the cognitive task that students are asked to do. So rather than are you giving just more examples than the previous one, or maybe inserting vocabulary, but are you advancing it? So if you look at the top one, it's going from beginning is us, I can state something, right? I can I can find something, maybe I can hear a science question from class, and I can state that. I can put it forward to you. As we move forward, they start to do more things with it. So then, you're actually, in the next one here, I can make that claim, but also I can contextualize it. I can, so taking that level, not just identifying it, but, but bringing in some meaning or understanding to it. Then we move into the next level to say, okay, now you can make a claim and actually bring it into your reasoning. How are you using that evidence? How are you um, advancing it? And, and this one, from the standards, we've identified that as, that's meeting the standard. If somebody can take, take the claim, really bring it in, use the evidence and understanding, that's in the standard. But what does it look like for somebody who has a deeper knowledge, that deeper place and this distinguished? In this one, it's saying, I can make a claim that states the relationship between dependent and independent variables. So in this case, again, a little bit more complexity, <coughs> a little bit less kind of um, known pieces to more how am I processing and making meaning of it. So, we developed these sorts of rubrics for many standards across our courses. So the plan is to continue to go forward with these. They provide a clarity. They provide a, a focus on achievement that we find to be really good in classes. Um, so there's an example of those. Yeah. So you said we developed it? <coughs> so many of these have been developed by teachers in the building. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have done some review pieces process with other schools as well, but a lot's been developed. Lovely school. Thanks. They've developed from. So the, the way, to, yeah. So the way you take it is, you take the standard, you look at the standard as written, and you identify what's the, again, what's the kind of the cognitive thinking level that the standard is asking students to do, and then from that it was identified that in this, again, being able to integrate evidence of reasoning, present and analyze evidence, construct detailed explanation was at that level. And then what would that look like not quite there, kind of approaching it? What would it look like two steps below? And what would it look like in an advanced step? Okay. Yeah, that's been, I'd say that's a probably been a, a four to five year undertaking. We've been kind of going through those standards and, and, and bringing them in. And so that's why this collection of rubrics is really pretty powerful. And it's also led to, as far as shifting instruction in the building of people being more intentional on what are these standards and how are we ensuring the continuity across classes? How are we making sure that we have the validity in what we're teaching? But an adjustment. And the adjustment that came through is that the buckets are too big. The buckets are too big at one, two, three, and four to give enough uh, um, feedback to students and feedback to parents. Needing something between a one and a two, two and a three, three and a four. So to add some pieces in there. So the... Um, Oh, I jumped ahead a little bit in this. I'm going to pull this forward and we'll say this will work. Um, <coughs> I'm going to come, if you look at the far right here, what I'm speaking to is how we're adding in some of these intervals. And this actually comes later in the slideshow, you see it. 
but the idea being that between the three and four, you can have these intermediary marks, 3.3 and 3.7, the same between the, the two and three and, and those places. Where we heard the feedback on this, a, a few pieces. Um, one is from teachers. Teachers say, hey, this is tough. I've got two students. I have one student who just hits the three, just barely makes it to the three. And I've got one student who's really beyond the three, but not a four, but they both have to be assigned to three. And that doesn't seem right. And that doesn't seem right to the students. And we have parents who say, um, when I get this just three or just this two, there's not enough for me to really talk to my child about. I can't really say how you're working on it. Um, students say too, you know, how can I, I want to aim for that higher grade, but going from three to four, it just seems really big. I don't even know like the steps to take within that. So giving teachers this opportunity to give more precise feedback with those intermediary scores. What this slide is showing us, we take the progression from on the far left here, how things were with a 100 point scare. So we had 42 possible grades. Then we shift down to only five possible grades. So we went from lots to too, too few. And now coming to this one, it seems the right size. The right size is what we're on. The other thing that's happening across these scales, the 100 point grades were based primarily on a percentage. Right? That's a percentage that somebody was able to identify something where the middle one is based on levels of achievement, and the third one is also levels of achievement, but with more intervals, it seems to be more appropriate than those levels. Go ahead. Okay. So again, that's what they look like. So if you think of the rubric, we'll still have the same clear steps at one, two, three, and four, but the teachers have this range of scores. And so the teacher can say, you know, you are better than a three. You can explain why. You can say, like, you know, you started to get to these aspects of a four, but not quite there. Um, maybe you're really close to a four. It's 3.7, those sorts of things. But um, we're bringing those in. Again, like um, Jim was saying before, the want of standards is pretty clear. So this question was, um, to how important it is to folks to have a level of achievement. So I can see that in each standard. I can see the parent feedback and the student feedback. Like I said at a previous board meeting, it was pretty exciting the level of turnout we got, and not just the level of turnout we got, but that it was really well representative of our student and parent body. If you look at the distribution, it matches pretty closely the class levels at each grade level. Um, but with the standards, what came through in the feedback was that people are having a hard time understanding what they were, what, what is the standard, and also this idea of kind of usefulness. How do I connect the standard to what my child's bringing home for homework, or what they're talking about from the assignments in class? This is one for anybody in the room who's looked on the jump rope portal, so only people who have students in the middle of high school right now. We, um, we made a system that was overly complex and we're simplifying it considerably. And what it was based on is that standards in the on loan portal were not only listed in the, the specific, in this case, English standards of language, reading, speaking, listening, but also had an overlay of these transferable skills, which can make a standard show up multiple times and really hard to understand. Something that had value in doing some data gathering for us, but for our audience of parents and students, completely overcomplicated. So kind of this shift to how we're simplifying the language. So those who, again, have done it, have seen it. Those who haven't seen it, don't worry, it won't be there. <laughs> All right. Um, so really keeping that, that value of the standard. <coughs> Questions as we're going through? Or? So wanting to make the standards more clear on the report card, how can we actually see them? So these are science standards. So this is the next generation science standards. And these are the anchor standards that's identified in our schools. So making use of structure, modeling reasoning, recognizing using patterns, and sense making and problem solving. So still giving <laughs> disaggregated feedback on those standards, we can still see them. Uh, there were some spots in reports where we compress those, we'll show the model those later. They're compressed, but keep them out so people can see them. But we're working on the language too to make sure there's enough language here that people can make sense of them and know what the standards are, but not so much language that it becomes too difficult to get through in the process.
another clear finding from the survey is that letter grades are important to both parents and students. So if we look at, again, those who said it was not important to the parents, we have less than 10% and the students less than 8%. Uh, so the course grades will all be converted to a letter score. So we have in the, in the grading or student assessment in, in class, we have those rubrics on a, on a four point scale. But we take those scores and convert them into a letter grade for the overall course grade. So if you say, you know, I earned a B plus in algebra or whatever those are. So here's, here's the system we have. Rack, you want to speak to the chart that? Yeah, so we actually presented this earlier today to, um, to the policy committee. And I'm looking at Pam because Pam made a suggestion. And we actually went and kind of reworked it uh, according to that suggestion and, and made it match up much more closely with, um, with what we have um, actually in place right now. Um, and, and so the whole idea is here is that in the grade book, you're, you're getting a score, and that score can be anywhere from, from a zero to a four, and it can be all those different intervals. And that score, we're depending on where you fall in, in, in that score, you, it's then converted to a letter grade, which in turn, eventually at the end of the course, is converted into a GPA. Um, and so one of the things that we're trying to do is, is to simplify this and to provide some alignment between the score averages and the GPA values so that they, they, they connect. And, and what you'll see is that if you fall into um, one of those, the, those buckets, those score average ranges, that, that you're getting a letter grade and that your, your GPA value sort of goes up to the highest point in that range. And then, so that's how you can progress up through those different pieces. Um, but this changed today after a good conversation with the policy committee. We'll do the, the next one. So, yeah, so um, one of the other pieces that we talked about was um, having each standard having equal weighting and determining um, the course grade. So, um, this and um, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, I guess I think it's a little bit. So, we're looking at, um, and that comes to do a bit of, again, kind of the calculation methods, but also that, that understandability. So, when you get those those standard scores, how are they, how do they come together to make an overall grade? And so Ralph will speak a little bit more about how we calculate those and how they're, they're based on, on equal weighting. The other piece that was a tenet that we first put forward was the need to separate habits of work and learning howls separately. And we wanted to really put that information out there because the pieces we identified for that are participation, perseverance, and preparation three critical things for success. We know in school and life, these are important pieces. So we wanted to be able to report on those so we can give students and parents feedback on, is this part of what's going on either well for a class or maybe an area of struggle? Maybe we need to work on those places. Um, we worked on the idea of keeping them separate and not impacting the grade because it seemed like a, a purity sort of thing to do. But what we proposed here with the policy committee is to add it, it as 5% of all overall grades. And the reason for this is because these howls are really important. And, and love it or, or hate it, if you don't equate something to a grading class in a school, it does have less value. So one place to put it a high value. And, and since it is something that's important to us, we wanted to incorporate it in some way. So we're trying to find what's a, what's a value, percentage value that seems right and fair, that keeps it important, but doesn't make it to be um, over over impactful in the grade. So in that list. So what does this look like when this all comes together? Um, so right now, um, in order to try to back calculate your grade um, in, in in the system, it, it is incredibly complicated. It, it's it's very very difficult to do, and it's there's a lot of steps, and it's not clear at all. So by making the standards equal weight. Um, they would factor into e equally within a course grade. So in this case, you'll see on the bottom here, you'll see those, those three howls that, that Garen described. Those are just averaged, and then that average goes into 5% of the overall grade. Um, and then each of the other standards are, are equally weighted um, to, to, to make up um, this overall grade, which can be converted into a letter grade. Um, and, and this is a pretty big shift. Yes. Um, we think that it will, will, will lead to some make it much easier to understand. So, so this could be printed on a syllabus. So, so depending on the, the number of standards that you have in a course, um, you know, th this information can readily be made available to, to students and to parents about how the overall course grade is composed. 
Um, it, it also can lead to some good conversations around really focusing on the standards, so making sure that the standards are equally valued in the course um, and, and, and working towards there, while still providing feedback to parents and students about students' um, achievement in each of those standard levels. <laughs> Um, so, so we hope that this will clear it up and, and, and also provide some benefit in terms of the instruction. Okay. Um, again, this line about uh, understandability of the standards. How do I know what they are? What do they look like? Um, on the top part, we were putting out report cards that really that just came out with numbers. Um, if you're online, you could drop down and see some information. But want to get the information out to parents more readily available so you can see what it is. So the bottom is the revised report card that would have those the same standards indicated we've seen before. So you can see what's beneath the grade and what's what are the, the factors that, that fit into it. Uh, another piece that really came through in, in both the survey response questions, and I saw it a lot in the feedback that people gave, was this disconnect between the standards I see on the report cards and what my child's doing in class. I, I don't understand the connections. So at the grading intervals, teachers will put on a, a, a general narrative about what's happening in the class. I mean, it's not going to be student-specific to this one, but course-specific and time-specific. So an example could be um, the standard is modeling. And they, well, well, I don't remember my child doing any modeling, but the narrative would say, it's eighth grade, science, and this is when the students are working on the Rube Goldberg machine, and we were modeling energy transfer. And so now I can get a sense of, okay, so that was the assignment my child was working on, I can, I can make that connection. So trying to put in these pieces that, that make those supports. We don't have a mock-up for this right now, we didn't, weren't able to bring that in from the, the jump rope, but you can imagine it with that, that course grade, um, with a description, here's what's happened in this four or five week period, and here are the standards for it. Transcripts, as we talked about, what's on the transcript, and so, as Rack said before, the end product, the transcript product here, is a letter grade, and then with the familiar GPA corresponding value. So the values we saw before, I think most are familiar with them. That's how the college board sees it. That's what most universities see. You know, it's an A minus, it's a 3.67. It's kind of standard practice. So on the left is what a transcript has looked like from our school. So the, with the, the year, and you see the courses, and this is a 100 point example of the credits, um, with a credit count, a GPA count on the bottom. And on the right is a mock-up of what, um, what it will look like in, in the proposed system. So with the course listed, with by the grade, um, by the credit. You can see where on the far left it has the year. This is just capturing the top. So this mock-up, it's just going back to a past year. Another one is about uh, the syllabus. We actually have a syllabus template that is um, well used by teachers, but I've learned that the accessibility of it for, for parents is is not always easy. And some some teachers may put them on Google Classroom, say we might have them into the Plus portals, but how do we have those standardized places where we can get to them? So we're really looking at that we have them, and then those multiple places where we can find them and make sure you can see those. So is that, sorry, yeah. is it um, yeah. just the standards or the rubrics as well? Transparency? Got it, great, great question. question. So on the syllabus is just the standards. The, the rubrics get to be a large piece, but how do we access those? So usually you access the, the rubrics per assignment. Okay. So if your child gets an assignment in the class, it goes home with the rubric, we see it. Or it's posted on Google Classroom that time. Um, we haven't gone to a place of, of putting them all out there. Um, it's something we, are, we aspire to do, but we haven't done it yet. But so before yeah, the yeah, student begins work on a particular yes. standard, they know what they're working towards. Of course. Okay. That's, that's, that's the whole basis that's the basis of that's what, yeah. the proficiency right. learning system. Yeah. You have to tell the children what you're actually what? looking for. It's not right to just throw a test at them and not tell them what they're looking for. That's right. So it's, it's that tool. And that's what you hear the terminology around the, the formative assessments, which are really kind of practice assessments. We're kind of like working on the skills. And then when you get to what's called a summative assessment is, how is the student able to do that independently? And that's it. 
another one is a question around like the standards of, of practices. Um, again, if we can roll back to before we were trying to do these systems, the grading system was essentially, teacher, what I need from you at the end of your course is give me an overall grade. And, and you should have some standards by which you met that grade, but it was pretty open and individualized class by class. So one is how do we have a standardized system so then we can make sure that we're all accountable to it. Like I said in the beginning, what are those clear expectations that that's parents and students can expect from the system? And one that we know really hinges on all this feedback system is making sure that things are done timely, and making sure that things are done by uh, enough, enough closeness to when the assessment happened that you can actually respond to it and move on to it. So that's a um, place we're going to, how do we build those places in? And, and those are you know, two aspects of it that kind of working with, with teacher groups a little bit. One thing we have, we have the system is based on seven checkpoints. The, the first one is longer, it's eight to 10 weeks, and then checkpoints two through eight are all between four and five weeks. So those are kind of like the larger kind of marking periods. But working within those time frames, what is the right turnaround? What's the right turnaround when we make sure that things get out fast? Um, so the, Claire, you had a question? Okay. okay. Um, so these are just two <laughs> points to uh, two points for us to be working on with kind of our, our faculty and building these Yeah, I think like uh, yeah. for me, it was a third point also, Ralph. Correct me if I'm wrong. But the third point was um, what needs to take place relative to the ability to retake an assessment, like specifically like a summative assessment, right? Yeah. And so there was there were procedural items and just so that the board understands that what we were really trying to do was to create a policy that gave the administration and the teachers enough flexibility to implement you know, proficiency-based grading and to see how it goes and to begin to flesh out, okay, what are the procedures that really support them without having to move those into a policy level at this point. But we want to watch those closely. We want you to come back to us with, here's what they are. Uh, the one for like timeliness of like putting grades in. That, that was a big one that we discussed and it was important. Um, and so we want more specifics around that coming back to the board because these are procedures that haven't really existed before, but as we put into, and put into place this grading approach, which is really designed to systematize our grading so that you know, students understand what's expected, teachers buy into it, and parents can understand it and participate, um, these procedures support that. So we're looking for the administration to come back to us with, here's specifics around those procedures so that we can review them and follow them. and then. You know, over time, if they can say at a procedural level because it's going well, that's great. At some point, we might move it to a policy level if we need to push a little bit harder. And we've had like a very good conversation around exactly that topic. And I think that's kind of where we are. Jim and Pam, correct that's me if I'm wrong. Right. Yeah, so that third item was, um, for an example, you know, the time frame. So the teachers have to put it into a grade book. Excellent. We did not say what. We're leaving it up to. Um, Garen and his staff to come back with what's a reasonable time. Right. And then it's going to go and say that at that point then, if a child, you know, the whole idea behind proficiency learning is supposed to be that you can get another shot at it, okay? So um, they'll have so much time after they get the grade to say they're going to come back. But if they didn't do their howls correct, they must have everything done. Because if we're going to give them that other shot underneath this new learning system, you know, you have to show that you are a student that's just not going to say, I'm not doing all this other little work, my homework and my reading and everything else, and I get to take the test all over again. You cannot take it until, it, until you have that completed. And if the time goes by, then you messed up. So it could be two weeks, three weeks. We're letting staff clarity, come back right. with a right. clear number. <coughs> and then, you know, if I messed up on it, if I got a 75 on it for some reason, you know, maybe because I didn't do my homework. But now clear, I have to go back and do it. Right, but it's and clear expectations for students, right? right? They know, right. you know, what the, what's expected of them. I think it helps the, the teachers because now they can systematize grading. By the way, I like the idea that our teachers have actually gone through and created these rubrics. I mean, if you've created a rubric for a standard, you actually know that you standard. Know, right. You yeah. really yeah. can't yeah. avoid it. Yeah. And I think that's like a really powerful thing that's happened. So thank you for doing that. Yeah. These There's are things we let yeah. off to. Right, right. these are right. things that like the administration and the teachers have taken. And, and put together. So now what we're looking for is really the next set of procedures that underlie uh, proficiency-based grading. And over time, like as a policy committee, we're gonna be looking for that and bringing it back to the board 
and basically saying, how's it going? I mean, that is really where we're at. What's the feedback from the community? We tried really hard, and the administration, I think, did a good job of this. Make it more understandable for the public. You know, one of our points was, if, if parents can't understand it, it doesn't count, right? It, it has to be understandable. Same for students. And so, like, the, um, the translation into letter grades and a GPA, we think was a big step forward for having, like, understandability. We also thought that, you know, that four-point grading system didn't offer enough opportunity for, like, students who want to aspire or students who are like trying to understand where they are to really conceptualize what they had to do to go to that next level right yeah. so adding in now having 11 grading points i think lets us systematize it in classes so we don't get randomness of grading but at the same time lets everybody else understand here's what i have to do to get to that next level so i think it was you know a, a good kind of meeting in the middle and seeing how this goes this will be under constant review though this this will be something we're talking about for the next you know year two years three years so yeah, thanks for that. I anticipate doing the same sort of parent surveys, too, about how is it going. I think we all found that to be really important to our parents. Okay, okay. Yeah. Our hand up yeah. behind oh, okay. Sure. Uh, I just had a question about making <coughs> up. Um, it's, it's having that second opportunity to do a test, correct? If you've done all the work in your house and you're up to date. It's not if you... Right. Unfortunately, messed up your test, but you, it's because you skipped like homework assignments right. and so on and so forth. Well, so if, you so skip, if you skip mm -hmm. your homework assignments, mm -hmm. okay, and you did not that well on your summative test, mm -hmm. okay, and you want another shot, this is where it comes clear that we need to know, and we're waiting for administration to come back of what the deadline is for the teacher to put the score into the grade book. And then from there, when the last student has time to retake the test, we're not saying the student can't retake the test if they're caught up on all their work, such as what you're saying, homework. Okay. If they, so if they have two weeks, let's just say, from that date, and they don't have all that other stuff done, checked off, they're not. Go they're going to be stuck with that first grade because they didn't go and, and clean everything up. So there's a few scenarios there. One is so in like the standard screen, it could be look, my first go on it, I don't like the, the the score I achieved, and the message the teacher might be say it's the same standard. Don't redo that assignment. Really focus on the next one because that's that's going to crush it. So that's one response to it. There's another response to that was well, what about when it's at the end of the school year? and the student is, is really buying the grades. And this is what we might think about, as Jim's saying, what might be some extra opportunities that are given to students during like an exam period or, or an outside of, the, outside of the class in some ways. The other thing around- But we do want to, like, just to be clear, yeah. we do want that to be like codified in a procedure right. so that everybody understands it pays. Exactly. That was like where we were going is like, like right. give this like some clear understanding. They're really like the three procedures, like right. timeliness of the grade book, time frame for makeup work and missed assignments, and then what's required to retake an assessment, exactly. right? Exactly. It's not just a, hey, you get to retake it. Exactly. You actually have to do all your work, and that's what Jim's right. talking and about. And it's not the same task. That, right. what, what you're saying is another summative or whatever, right. based on whatever. Right. I'm, I'm not saying, you, you don't get to take the yeah. same test yeah. over. And but these are, are, yeah. like Lou was saying right. and I'm saying, it's, it's you have to have your work. You're not gonna come into this school and say, I don't have to do my homework because it's on my house because it's only 5% of my grade. You need, if you want to have that shot of taking that test over, how many people here would like to have another shot of trying to pass a standard when you were in school or whatever, I mean? But we, we do think, however, like, you know, between that and the fact that the howls are integrated within the grade now, like, that does give it, like, more meaning. Like, Pam showed an example from her classes that she teaches at UVM. You know, basically how she integrated something like this and it changed the behavior of the class. Now, we're not assuming our high school students are ready to be college students yet, so we wanted to have it be meaningful without like being something that if this isn't how you operate necessarily yet, that you could um, you could still get a good grade, but it would mean something to you to actually like follow these house uh, in Pam, a meaningful Pam's way. Class. So. 25%. Yeah, Pam's class was much. <laughs> <laughs> your A comes down to a C if you're not doing your, your house. Or if you're good. <laughs> <laughs> if you're already good. So a there's a lot of those today. kind of procedural pieces. I really appreciate Lou's framing of it. And I would ask that, again, that's the work we're doing the faculty. Like, what are what are some ways to, to make those those clear procedures? Can I just... Know one of that? Yeah. Uh, so this being able to take over a test, is that a new 
procedure that we're looking at, or is that a practice? No, if you remember going back to day one, well, you weren't here day one. Tim and I were here day one. We're the only <laughs> ones. Um, the whole idea behind proficiency-based learning is, is that it is to give children, it's not, it's not to punish a kid, it's to give them the opportunity to develop of, them. of redoing right. and developing. So there's the formatives and then there's the summatives and there always were so there always was supposed to be a way that they can up that grade right. in some way with a different summative test. Yeah, and you should, instead of thinking of it as retaking the test, you should think about it as um, having another go at the standard. So we're going to move yeah. it forward. It's, it's not the same. Right. But there is a limit point. to that. There is a limit to yeah, that. The limit could be, you know, so again, a well-designed course has a certain amount of assessments mm -hmm. in it and we say like students should be able to with this enough, get there, right? We have that place. And Gary, yeah. one point yeah. that I think worth like reminding the board of is about decaying averages, right? Mm -hmm. So that like basically right. your work over time throughout the semester is more heavily weighted towards the end of the semester than the beginning because basically we're trying to assess right. where you are relative to these standards. Like it's the, right. we're, we're trying to incentivize, I guess, the proper outcome, which is that you're mastering these standards. And at the same time, give you some aspect of, here's some habits you need for life, right? Uh, and like those things go together, so we're trying to strike that balance. Well, that's, I think that's a uh, yeah, good one transition of, yeah, on that. One policy. piece that I'd throw out there is because of that decaying average, this idea of like retaking right. the first summative, for, for most students, most of the time is not gonna make any sense. The, the better strategy is to start working really hard for Get the your second summative right. because Sorry. you're going to be right. you're going to be tested on that again and it's going to right. count more than the first one right. so where you see this piece that you're talking about i would say particularly is related to the end of the year where there are some students that can get a no credit for the course right and so they they have this opportunity to fix that but i think the conversation that we had today is you don't get to not do any of the work and then just right. get a second chance. Right. But if you're willing to show that you're willing to go and make sure all your homework's done, you're rereading, you're preparing, you're doing your part, then we're gonna do our part and give you a second and chance. I think it's important that yeah. that is a message that parents can enforce, right? I think that's a position, we put parents in a position to help be successful guiding their children learning and students can have transparency, especially with some of the systems that RAF's bringing online, so parents can see it. That's why the timeliness matters, because like, I hate nothing more than going and looking on like one of the reports and saying, you know, pick any one of my children. You don't have these assignments done. I'm like, oh no, they're all done, Dad. You know, and I'm like, what do you mean they're all done? It says here they're not done, right? So like, having those pieces go together creates a synergy for this type of grading and this type of an approach. When we get the whole learning community together, I think we can have success with, it's going to take a little time, right? We're going to have to figure some things out, but I think we're a lot closer than we were. Yeah, well, we're <coughs> running the meeting. You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> You're in the policy committee. You're in the policy committee. Jump in. She's courteous. She's courteous, yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, I just wanted to, to say my, my overview comment is that um, conversationally, Claire said something a few weeks ago, or maybe months now, I don't know. Like, oh, I just wish we could have the best of both systems. And I do actually think that that what we have we're, it's not done but i i feel very good about where we're landing where we are right now in terms of having all that specificity of reporting that proficiency learning has and having the clarity of the gr of the grading reporting yeah um i did have a couple of questions yeah. just based on yeah well at a, at a different i guess the the slideshow before this okay. that we had seen there was a discussion about reporting summatives in letter grades too and i just wanted to know if that was still happening so not just report cards but throughout right. the throughout the year so what we've done with let's see here, these scores in the right is to make these numbers correspond directly with the gpa values that are the grading values so the the translation of so if I was on a singular assignment, we're still trying to emphasize more it's a score within the standards idea, but you could still look, if you scored a 3.3 and you look at, at the things, that's a B plus. So we have that. So um, there's a question of, can we write that on the paper or have it in some ways? It's an easy, straightforward translation. So, um, so that was the intention to make sure it's all well aligned so we could do that. If, so there's still a question right. about whether if it's the right thing to do, right. I would say. Okay. I would like to have faculty weigh on that a little bit and see. But as far as the system set up that way, like when Ralph is saying that 
adjustment to those um, score ranges for each grade, same thing, making sure those are all aligned with those GPA values closely. Now, mm -hmm. this is a 3.7, that's just a 3.67. Right, okay. Um, and then another question is about the house. We had talked earlier today about possibly making the house count for 10%, but maybe making it five at this point in time because um, some details of how uh, habits of work and learning are right. actually quantified in a meaningful way need yeah. to be worked out. And in the meantime, um, mm. we'll keep it at five, but yeah. is there sort of openness or what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I thought so to that. I, I thought it was important because I, I really hope that we can come to a system, as Lou said, we're going to keep getting feedback and doing some adjustments, but that we can stick with for some time. You know, I think this is, you know, a few okay. years. And as an, I feel there's a lot of value in having the howls in the grade. And so I think to have this starting point at 5% allows that adjustment. If we said it was not the grade at all, it would be a lot more difficult to get into it. So I agree with you. I think 5% is a good starting point, and then we can look at uh, okay. if that's right or not. And the, I just wanted to make one yeah. last oh, comment. Yeah. Um, I, I couldn't believe it today, I said this in the meeting, that after looking at proficiency grading for so long, yeah. it had never really sunk into me that we got rid of the D. Oh. And um, I feel like a lot of parents don't realize that, yeah. and, and I think it might be useful to sort of make that Say it. Just get it out there. Yeah. Um, I, I fully support it. Yeah. I think we shouldn't be having poor work. So yeah. uh, I just think it's interesting it's that nobody really talks about that. Yeah, and we did that as intentional. I mean, it was the truth is we had a, a 60% as a passing grade in the school for a long time, and kind of had to bite your tongue to think: Are we really having students earn credit who really can do it at a skill at a level we think is is satisfactory? And so, kind of to up yeah. that to level. So thanks for that. Um, I had a question about the house, and yeah. I have so many questions, but uh, yeah. mm -hmm. I also think that, you know, we can debate a lot of this for a very long time, and I, I also want to caution, because I think that a lot of this, you know, th seems like we could get too restrictive, mm -hmm. and then I don't know what the feedback from teachers is at this point, or if teachers have weighed in on this at all, but the habits, the house, for example, what has the weight of it been in the past? Right. And we're saying now we want right. to hopefully get it to be 5%. So I'm just curious. So this year it was 0%. It wasn't in the grade at all. Mm -hmm. um, prior to that, it was up to teachers' decision making. Some some minutes at 25%, this, mm -hmm. this kind of level. Uh, in the conversations I've had with teachers since we've been doing this revision, uh, there's a feeling that no percent undervalues the importance of house. So there's this want, but again, like what's the right level? It's still kind of figuring that out. And the way they're determined is, so the academic ones are on those uh, achievement levels, I should or that level of, of cognitive task. With Howells, it's the frequency with which you do it. So just basically, so preparation, are, are you prepared you know, regular, most of the time, some of the time, none of the time, this sort of thing. So that's, so it's a different level how we look at them. We have, um, you know, criteria really well articulated for each of them. They probably each have seven to nine indicators. And so it's, it is spelled out. The idea is to get those concepts in front of students a lot so they know what it is. So participation doesn't always mean you're a hand up all the time. Participation, there are other ways that you're involved in class to get those nuanced ones. So you're right, though. There's right. a lot so of yeah, work on and that. For, depending on the course that yeah. you're taking, participation, like you said, can take many forms. Mm -hmm. And a teacher might want it to be 15%, and the teacher might want it to be 5 and somebody might want it yeah. to be 20 And so I, that just worries me a little bit. Is it too good for hand we, teachers? Yeah. yeah. And that's one to think about. I, I did miss say earlier, there were four things that we wanted, like, more specific procedures <laughs> around. <laughs> no, it wasn't three. Three. No, 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 no. one category. No, because this is the yeah. trade-off, right? And this <laughs> kind of addresses part of your concern, like how does this roll out, mm -hmm. is that we didn't want to put everything on a policy level because that would restrict administration and implementing, right? But we do want to see the procedures and monitor their progress to figure out if it might have to go to a policy level at some point or if it could say at a procedural level. So the fourth item was like, you know, how do howls get measured? Like we had talked about number, but that seemed pretty vague. So like, how do you do it? Is it like a percentage of the time? Like, how do you measure that so that yeah. teachers have some understanding of like how to implement it, but students have a clear understanding of what's expected of them on that front too, since we are putting it into a grade. So that was like actually the fourth yeah. procedural area we were looking for. And in the teacher work group, when we looked at these revisions, the thought was, this is where we have the most work to do because we haven't had to put a lot of attention on it because it hasn't had an impact on the grade, but it does. And if we're going to do something that impacts the grade, we've got to make sure that we have real confidence doing it well. Claire? 
Um, first, thank you to the policy committee and to the administration. I know this has taken like a ton of meetings and work, so thank you all for doing that. <laughs> for sure. Um, I have a couple of questions um, or thoughts. One is how, with the decaying average, I think one of my concerns is I have had students say to me, I really like the decaying average because I know I don't really have to work hard at the beginning and then I can make up for that later on. So how do you kind of monitor um, that that's being used in the way that's so intended or how do you assess that as you go? So we had a discussion in the policy committee Mm -hmm. about the decaying average and, and 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 I'll say it again like I said today in the meeting to be quite honest with you there's always been decaying average in school mm -hmm. there was always a decaying average when I went to school you knew that the final exam was worth 40% of your total grade your your, your midterm was worth 20% of your grade and the rest was there we we as a group of the three policy members have stated that the formula that they put in front of you of what a decaying average is, is for 66% or whatever, will take up that whole board over there. <laughs> um, what we have um, directed to the administration is to try to come up with something that's going to be clearer, that it will come back to, I believe this is what we're looking for, something that's going to say, the final exam is worth 40, 50 X, okay? Mid is this, and then take the other four report cards, because that's what we do, right? Four report cards, a middle exam, and a final, correct? That's kind of the old system. This system's running for the year. A little, bit, little, yeah. little bit further, but so those other remaining uh, report cards there are going to have X left over, say it's 30%, and then it's going to come back and say, maybe the first report, maybe the first one, I don't know, it's only worth two or three or four percent. And then the second one is worth whatever. So, and that gets back to what Mary Beth was saying that, you know, they maybe put more of their time into further summative exams to keep up with the class. And that is something we identified for like monitoring closely. Right. Because I think, but we've I think always, we've yeah. always had to decaying, I think we should stop worrying about that word because I know there's a lot of parents like what's decaying average mm -hmm. we've all had it when we went to school by the way if we try to design an education system that students aren't going to gain in some way it will That's never ever happen <laughs> <laughs> so I've done that my entire career <laughs> but I do think that what we have to do is that we have to like um, we have to make sure that for somebody who's not in this all the time like and we've been pretty deep in this that if you're a parent you can look at it and you can understand it if you have 10 minutes or five minutes to look at this you can say I understand how that works if it's more complicated than that, then we need to go back and rethink it. Right. So. And so the short answer to, to Claire's question mm -hmm. is we went through different percentages, what should be. And we felt there was a compromise of between really emphasizing more recent work, but still the work that came before still matters. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of where it came to be. Um, things to look at that, that just again, like why do it? So if you take a student who consistently earns twos across the whole year, and they get a two at the end, they get their C, versus a student who maybe had a lot of ones in the beginning, but then ended up with fours at the end, but it averages out to a two, do they both deserve a C? Mm -hmm. What the, this yeah. average says is no, the one that actually was able to hit the four, they deserve a higher grade because they actually grew over the year. And so that's, that's why we did it. That's the I think this is one of the really yeah. powerful underlying yeah. ideas of what we're doing here, right? I think there's a lot of value in this that the board should recognize, and I hope the public will understand, is that a decaying average, I, I think, incentivizes better scholars, you know, better learners in the way that we want them, which is keep improving, right? Don't, you, you got a bad first grade, don't quit, right? right? I mean, you can do better. And it also means don't just drop off at the end of the year and forget to do any work, right? So, you know, seniors, you still have a week left. Um, you know, this is important stuff, and, and we need to, like, this system, I think, does that, and, but it's worth monitoring, to like Claire's point, to make sure that we're not missing something where people right. say, oh, you know what, the first six weeks, who cares? Right. Right? What? So. And I wanted and to just to connect yeah. up with your, your comments about monitoring and on a work plan, November 25th, which is about the time right after folks will get their first report cards, that you give us enough time to survey um, and get back to you on, here's what we heard, Did, you know, are, yeah. are we get, does it appear that things are working better or not so that you can monitor and hold us accountable and um, continue with this process and be sure that things are, are happening at a level that you're comfortable with? 
Uh, only the class would have to you, Bob. Class had a few questions. I thought Sorry. I had two questions. <laughs> <laughs> I got some thinking ahead, right? I'm trying to be mindful, too, of this system and how we're preparing our students for university. And I think there are so many great things about this when you're in high school and it's very clear what your teachers are expecting of you and the rubrics. I like all of that. Um, and then also the, you know, the option or the opportunity to retake tests or get second chances. When I was at university, that did not happen. And, and I don't know, I haven't been to university in many years. Um, so it I don't know if good. things have changed, but my concern is, are we holding, <coughs> are we yeah. giving them too much hand holding? Or is there a way to think ahead to maybe seniors get a little bit less of that? I, uh, how can we make sure we're still preparing kids for the rigor yeah. of university? No, that is a great point. And then is the idea of like, how do we kind of like taper off those supports appropriately for right. a transition to something else? Have you and it, and it, it matters, yeah. And that's, that's a concern that I have, a concern that if we have students who are struggling in colleges, it's because we haven't given them those kind of a non, you know, like autonomous tools and that sort of work. But we so can do a yeah. version of it in yeah. what, like Jim had talked about, in that if you want to retake an assessment, you have to have done all the work. Right. Like there's an accountability built into that. It's not a free pass, right. you know, and, and so like, but I do think this is worth watching, right? As right. we put this system into place. And the standards, place, I think it's so important that children mm -hmm. know what's, or students know what's expected of them on assignments, but <coughs> how much do you, uh, Pamela, how much yeah, do you get of that at university? I get a lot of you could go uh, okay, people shocked. Shocked. At that there's an expectation of accountability and right. you have done poorly on this and that's too bad and there's nothing you can do now because it's over. Right. Right. So, and, and what about assignments? Struggle. Do you think that they're in university assignments are very clear where students know what is expected yes. of them? Okay. Yeah. So that's yeah. helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So in the old not that old. <laughs> <laughs> you got an 85 on a test, and, 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 and I don't know how many people here went to school, but your teacher said, if you want to up it, do this extra credit. Yeah. And that extra credit would be basically nothing, really, and you'd, and you'd get up to the next grade of an A. What we're doing here is saying, we're not letting you have extra credit, some easy thing like my health teacher would say who's going to win this weekend's football game and you got an extra so so basically you're not getting that easy extra credit you're going to have to go back and you're going so like saying like taking another so there's different exam right. you yeah. have but to but do all the, the it's a lot more idea. harder than just writing up an essay on something and getting 10 extra points thrown But the underlying grade. idea was this, right? That extra effort could lead to a better grade. What we're basically saying is we want you to put your extra effort into something that's actually moving towards proficiency, right? Not like Jim's teacher. And we don't even want to identify that teacher. <laughs> but, um, but like by doing your assignments and getting them all done, then you can do like another take at the assessment. Like I think what we want to do is we want to have clear expectations for students and, and for teachers, but primarily for students so that they understand that this is the behavior that leads to another opportunity or extra credit, whatever we want to call it, another attempt in an assessment. It's not just something random, right? That's where I think a system makes a big difference and leads to a better learning community. So we got a lot of hands going up and I think Bob is next. All right. <laughs> I just make a super quick connection to that point, Lou, around the conversation we had about growth mindset at our retreat. Right? Growth mindset is I'm not there yet, right? And that this, this kind of an approach is if you're willing to do the work and keep trying, then we're, we're willing to go there with you, right? It's not sorry, you're done, right? But so it, it's in alignment with some of the things that we've talked about um, in our portrait. Thank you. Yeah. So my was just back on the hows, given that 5% yeah. of the grade next year. And so where, where, do, where does an incoming seventh grader begin to understand how the hows work? Right. Is that done yeah. by individual classroom? Do you get them, everybody right. in the auditorium and talk about how hows work, the expectations, what's participation, what's not? Yeah, so in that example, it's really the seventh grade team that kind of works on, on bringing students in and understanding how it works. Uh, or is that something we need to be tasking our sixth grade teachers? With yeah, too? that could be something as well. That's um, a really good question. I don't think right. we've covered that one yet. Right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's a great question. I think we're doing it at the point. Because you could do this too. You could, you know, at what point is it proper to start entering scores into the grade book and hours? We know ultimately it's going to be 5%, but that doesn't mean that from day one you have to put any scores in there. You say we have to make sure that the students actually have scores. There's a lot of these 
as you right. that's it's kind of like the audience for the faculty work through it. Right. So you know, we did say in we our were looking for that, like yeah. just understanding of how howls get measured, like systemically, right. what's it look like? And one of the things we discussed is that systemically, it doesn't look the same in every class. Like there's big differences between a math class and an art class. There's similarities, but there are differences, and we need to come up with a system that like brings enough of a systemic approach that teachers can be s c consistent and students can understand it, but allows for the differences that are like natural in that those type of like topical areas. So. But, but we did say that in the beginning of each class, that first week, the teacher will be explaining it every year what I expect out of this classroom. Oh, so the students, the syllabus has to be put out. The other room is happening, whatever. Right. And and how you're going to be graded, and the five percent is a grade, and they're going to have to go over that. That was the only one that we didn't get into of saying there's like maybe six different or four different items, whatever the teacher is going to say, and that's five percent of your total grade. But we and, and we didn't want to get into it. Is it's only it, it's howls of work, and the teacher can be saying, you know what, I'm going to grade on your howls. Uh, bringing in your computer is. 5% of the total, you know, and, but doing your homework is whatever, and we're not going to get micromanaging that. Well, I'll bring that back to the board. We do, as I said, we have those kind of identified criteria. What what are those things under each of those three categories? Yeah. I'm less so, worried about the micromanagement yeah. from the cl classroom, other than maybe the, the culture yeah. of messaging yeah. at an assembly right. around, you know, here here's what this all yeah. is, hearing yeah. it from the principal. Yeah, and, you know, and we're starting to see if you walk through some of the classes, particularly in the seventh and eighth grade, there's posters up to describe these things and how yep. we built that poster. Right. We got Patty up. We got Patty's way instructed. All right. Mm -hmm. um, are there any classes that are structured kind of with an escalating um, difficulty of material, say, that make um, the weighted averages maybe a little bit less um, applicable in those situations? You know, I think of some, you know, I think of me in calculus in high school is what I'll go back right. to. You know, and how the first two semesters were pretty easy, then the second two, two semesters not so easy. You know, are we adjusting the standards for a class like that to make the weighted averages kind of work out, or you know, should we be looking at? Uh, are you looking right. at? I guess right. you know, classes yeah. um, individually to see how much you can weight the third and fourth semester compared to the first to second, if the um, if, if right. the class is structured in that way. Right. Yeah, we haven't thought of that. <coughs> Focused all on all courses are based on growth over the year, and you know the complexity of, of what's being asked of students grows over the time. Um, that we just kind of keep the, the same path. So we haven't thought about having a, a different a different percentage of the weight in different courses. That hasn't been a topic we've discussed. Because that that complexity is yeah. still represented in like the definition right. of the standards, right? Right. So like we're not going to get away from that because at some point we are working towards the standard. And the standard theoretically is not just it's the end point, but it's like the proficiency point. You can go beyond at some point, but you're going to get to that point if we're doing our jobs and the system works right. So there is a natural increase in complexity of the materials over time. Hopefully there's also a natural increase in the students' ability to understand that complex that you know, more complex materials. So Yeah. So yeah, my that question that was that um, kind of related uh, to Claire's in terms of uh, preparedness and um, in Again, all uh, well-intended, well-reasoned, good stuff. The homegrown standards, um, I assume those translate or have some connection to what we are seeing in standardized testing? Great. So the standards we use are not homegrown, just the way that we've, we've taken the standard and broken it into like a rubric. Okay. So the standards all come from the National if it's the Common Core, or the Next Generation, all those, and they all are they all correspond to the standardized tests we do, like the SBAC test and the SAT. So that's, that's one of the the nice advances in standards is that they are aligned across those things. What are we yeah. seeing? Like, is there any way to tell whether this switch in approach has um, resulted in better uh, test takers, uh, right. worse test takers? Is it foreign to them when they show up? I think it's too too recent to know that. Okay. Probably that's, I don't know, probably that's like a three-year question to kind of see, maybe sooner, but we don't have any like, solid piece. We're starting to do some, you know, to the star test a little bit of an assessment. We're trying, we have putting some tools in place, but certainly it's too early to see. Yeah, we're yeah. using, I mean, so, so we have the SBAC, which is our standardized measure, which is our accountability measure, but we, we've implemented this year a, an interim assessment called the STAR, where um, there's a really high correlation between that and the SBAC, and, and it gives us some some really detailed information about where students are and what they need to learn next. And, and so there's a lot of work to be done around looking at that, looking at the grades, like, like what is this whole picture of the student that's emerging, and, and what are the needs, and, and, and where do we see 
Where do we see areas of overlap? Where do we see consistencies? Where do we see inconsistencies? So I think there's a lot of work to be done on that front, looking at all the data that we have together. Okay, I guess mean, the concern yeah. is that, yeah, it's, uh, kind of going back to my original point, is um, great to be more fair and accountable and all these sorts of things, but if the system doesn't work as well as the old hard way that you know, Jim was right. talking about, then why are we doing it? Good point. Yeah. I, I think yeah. there's a really good reason for doing it there that like is probably lost sitting here, and that is this whole idea of like the psychology of engagement of students, right? Like, so things like decaying average, things like having standards that are like equally assessed, where you understand what they are, and there's rubrics that everybody understands. Like, there's a psychology of engagement that students have to have to become like top level scholars that a lot of systems don't have, right? I think this is a good step in the direction to figure out how does that work for our students and what would that system look like where kids are engaged and they stay engaged. They don't just like, oh, I can't do it, I drop out. Instead, they're on a path of, you know, growth mindset is, is really what is most pertinent here. And since we're kind of going in that direction, that's tied to our portrait of a graduate, you know, all those things, this is the system that I think helps support it. So. Right, I mean, look, uh, for the record, I'm all for it, I'm excited about it and everything, but let's not breathe our own fumes, yeah, right? No, I agree. At the end you. of the day, we might look at it and go, wait a minute, we're not setting our kids up for success. Right. We got yeah, Adam up that is right. always a good caution. So. Adam had his hand up. Uh, I guess I just need like a 10 steps backwards of a comparative context of, you know, regionally, nationally what is everybody else doing where's the what's the driving catalyst of, of this because for someone right. who's not in academics and right. partially the operating in the dark probably the biggest driving catalyst is to have courses and assessment practices based on the standards so we have standards from all the different disciplines and to make sure that, that that's beneath your courses and that's what students are working with and so that movement around that we're saying about what what are the standards how do we know that we're actually Assessing the right things, we're seeing that move. So that's that's the that's the big big piece there, and that's um, and then the ways in which states have gone about doing it have varied in a lot of ways. You know, certainly in Vermont, there is this real push to um, work on more of this kind of proficiency measures, and what does that look like? And where I feel like we're landing right here is really what we described as a nice hybrid model. We're looking one where we can really preserve the system of what are what are some standards-based practices, but still keeping some of those familiar benchmarks. But that's the context. Adam, the context is. Um, making sure that there are standards, that those standards are aligned with things like the SATs and other tests too. So for, for assessing students on those things, are, are the, the school-based pieces connected? So that's where it comes from. So then when they go to tier one, two, and three colleges, universities, yeah. how is it received if it's different across the country? Well, how is what received? Well, I think it's the grading so, system. So our grading system, we're producing letter grades that are easily identifiable. So that's part of it. So, so when somebody goes to apply to whatever university, they're presenting a transcript. That transcript that's has the letter grade. And right. Well, and then I'm where I'm they're going to, we're going to a GPA. Right. 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 Do you want to put the transcript up? So the letter. The, the, the transcript that's going to, the, he's asking about the college. We're transferring right. the letter grades throughout the year into a GPA. Mm -hmm. and the GPA no, there's a, there's a, the way that we wrote it is that you have a letter grade in the course and it has a corresponding GPA value. The transcript is going to show. Yeah, and that things. was a point of conversation, right? right. It, and that was right. kind of one of our early topics. How does this translate to colleges understanding it? Mm -hmm. And making sure that it is. And that's why there is the grade point average in the letter, the letter grade now, um, so which was a pretty substantial change from where we started. Right. So, so. Yeah. Here. so then if a, if a school wants to know about the grading practices, which matter, because you want to know that Know, what's the distribution of students getting certain grades? Like what's there? That's into our, our school profile. So Adam, just to confirm, this is what a transcript would look like, which is okay. a very, probably the most standard transcript you'll find. Yeah, all right. Uh, right. So you, you see what the GPA values are, right? So the GPA values are behind those letter grades, which calculate to the overall GPA. So this student on the right here, as a GPA of three. Yeah, I was just saying that we'll have to fix the computer system. Because right. that child has a 94.05 GPA on a 4 point GPA system. No, no, that one's 100 point or less. Which is also not great. Yeah, and I, I would <laughs> offer, too, when you think about grading, you know, the, the, the system that most people were familiar with, ABCD, that was an imperfect system at mm -hmm. best. <laughs> You know, and I, I have to say, I, I really mm -hmm. admire the community, our teachers, our leadership 
for sticking with this conversation to get this right, because this is not easy to get this kind of clarity around grading. Um, and uh, it is, there is, the old system was, was fraught with difficulty as well. And what, what the community is asking, what our teachers are unpacking, what our leadership is delving into is, we want to get this right. And, and I, I have to offer in my travels, I don't see many places that get this right and are willing to do the depth of work that this community is willing to do to get a system in place that, that really has a lot of validity to it and honors, um, honors students and their ability to um, persevere. Um, so I, I really think that, again, the community, our, our educators, our teachers, and our students all really deserve a lot of credit for the amount of time that's been put in this. And I think one of the things that people don't realize, because we were all like part of the system, we all went to school, so we feel like we know it, is that it is, it is an incredible, like the old system is incredibly inconsistent, even with the best of intentions, right? And it's incredibly hard to communicate like, what this means. When you go to the level of like saying, here's how you know, the proficiency-based grading works, here's what the standard is, here's what the rubrics mean. Like you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to be more consistent and fair to all the teachers and all the students who walk into the system. So that expectations are clearly set up front. Here's what we want out of instruction, here's what we expect out of learning, right? And if you do all these things, we should have an expectation of success. If that alignment isn't in place, then we've made a mistake. I think that alignment will be in place, but that is a big step forward from where we were even two years ago. So. This is like where I have fun because this is the gym Afro. You guys don't get to really speak until everybody else asks questions, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I'm just curious why we don't put more of an emphasis on the house in the percentage of a grade. Um, the reason being is because in the retreat we were talking about um, the culture of our school needing to be more disciplined within the classrooms um, for deadlines to be more uh, serious and taken more seriously by students as well as um, for preparing our students for secondary experiences post-secondary experiences after they graduate um, and sometimes I'm wondering if we should put more emphasis on on those house areas um, just to start developing that culture within the classroom and the school and and helping to prepare them for their future experiences because it doesn't matter if you're going off to a job or a college or um, a community school or an apprenticeship you have to meet your deadlines you have to be at work and in, in school on time you you know it, you have to have your homework done for whatever projects you're doing um, and sometimes I think our kids in the classroom have gotten a little lax with deadlines because they're not there's no consequences and I think we agree with you and that's yeah. why we put it in as part of the grade right the option mm -hmm. was put it in or don't put it in was the first decision yeah we decided to put it in then there was a conversation about at what level should it be valued mm -hmm. you know and really the conversation was around five percent or ten percent we decided to start with five percent because we don't have full clarity on how like this is going to roll out yet but over, over time, you know, if we're really confident in how this is working, it may go up to something like 10%. I think that's up for review. Well, it started so out at 20. Be, uh, like how, what would be the way in which we should reevaluate that? When would that happen? If, if I could offer, I know, Garen, you were talking about the rubrics, and the, the, the staff has done some remarkable work in building out these rubrics. But you mentioned four to five years. Now, the the howls I think could be a little bit tighter than yep. that, but there's some work to be done. I think another part of our conversation was that we meet the the staff and faculty at the middle school high school needs an opportunity to do some talking and discussing about how do we fairly evaluate these things and what does that look like. And until we have that kind of depth of conversation to assign more than a, a five percent value didn't seem fair as well. We talked today about it you know it's not fair for it just to be sort of a a loose perception of you know like I don't think you're you're really prepared that often you know or you know yeah you could participate more like what does that mean so yeah. coming up with those definitions yeah. seems really important to be fair but at the same time 
we don't want to be so burdensome on the teachers where, I mean, what are they doing? Like check marks every time someone talks and like doing mathematical <laughs> calculations? <laughs> like it's By the way, we have teachers that actually use software to monitor all the feedback. It's really cool to see like we have some really advanced stuff that could fit into this over yeah, time. But like, but Jen, like your point, and I think it's a, it's a fair question, right? What we asked for as a policy committee was to come back to us with the underlying procedures so we can review those and present them to the board. So even though we're a policy committee, Mike calls a procedure committee too. There's going to be some aspect of that. And then also, like one of the things that I like that the administration has done, you know, the feedback loop that they've created when they're putting out surveys, right? So like what feedback are we getting? So there are checkpoints. There may be more in the future. But there is some expectation of what's going to happen next and is it working, right? And, and that, that is the next conversation to engage in. <laughs> There's a two pretty broad comments, but related to, to what was just brought up, um, based off no no information whatsoever, which I don't usually comment on, but I think w this all sounds great once you guys kind of get the how the system zeroed in. Um, I would just offer that it might be nice to a point that if there's a student that you can somehow gauge that's prepared all the time, participates in, and perseveres consistently, that it's at least enough of a percentage with the eight or nine percent that would probably make a C to a C plus, yeah, you know, <laughs> once that's established. Um, but I, I really just wanted to echo what Lou is saying is I think that it's great how much work has gone into this because without a system, it's, it's hard to uh, know when you're looking at these results, even if we get software in place or other uh, programs in place to say track uh, students achievement and, and um, post-secondary schools and things like that if, if we don't have a s if we don't have a system in place you don't know what to change so no matter what happens here as long as the system is created I think that's great because then you can start evaluating the data and then decide how to move the needle because you have things in place right. that all of the teachers are following consistently and until that's in place you can't really do that as well so Mary Beth made a good point that. that we haven't brought up here like we now have a data group right we now have an assessment that's rolling out that's consistent like we have data coming back that we will you know, and we'll learn how to use it better that is coming back into the system now that's never existed before and so that is going to impact you know everything else that we see happening here. So there's there's multiple functioning pieces. Like this is not just singularly here's a policy proficiency based grading and house. There's other pieces that impact it that I think over time as a board we should get like very smart about. We should monitor and work with the administration to make sure that we're creating the best learning environment for our students that we can. And, and that's that's where we're all trying to go. And I think what has been worked on over the last I don't know couple months. I think is a really good step in that direction, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Paige about the concern about house. I would like to see at, at least 10%. I think 10% seems about right for high school, middle school, high school level. Um, but I understand the idea that these things need to be defined a little bit better. So I guess we'll just and, and then see how it goes. <laughs> and then I'm going to throw in, remember, this is a full board meeting here right now tonight. And there's three of us that are on policy, and we're coming here to you with our recommendation. It did start out on this of 25%. We did have a number of 10%. We went through the, um, the pieces of how it would be kind of harder on the teacher since we're throwing this in there at this point. But Paige, when you say like put more emphasis on, on the Howell's work, yeah. I mean, this board can come and direct. We're giving you a recommendation that this whole board now can come back and say, no, I would rather it go to 8, 10, 12, 15 percent. Mm -hmm. But I just want everybody <coughs> here to understand something that if you're just looking at this number saying that it's 5 percent, <laughs> there's a lot more if you really think of the number. Because, it, yes, it may be 5 percent of your grade, but if you're not doing that stuff, you are not getting that second chance of taking that second other summative exam, okay, which could mean way more than 5%. If you have an 80, if, if you have a, a, a 2.7 on, on your on writing in your English, okay, and you did, maybe, yeah, it's only worth 5%, but you have to have all that stuff completed to get that second chance in that allotted time slot to get that chance to get it that maybe you now jump up to a 3.3 or a 3. So howls are worth a lot here. It is really worth a lot. It may only be 5% of your total grade, but it's getting you that chance to get your total grade up if you are that hardworking student that persistently doing stuff. And I'm going to get that other chance. You know, but this board can come in here tonight and say, hey, 
you know, we do like the idea of everything, and we would rather see it to be 10%. I mean, that was part of our discussion today. Have we considered um, making it variable by course or putting it in the uh, yeah. hands of the, of the teacher to determine how much the house should be worth for a particular subject matter? Right. The we, you know, different models. I guess what I would like, I would like to, if we could take this direction, the board is feeling like this, having the incorporation of Howells and trades is right, feels like the right thing. And then to work with the faculty to see what that looks like so we could see in the classrooms and things like that. You know, for the first pass, we did want to put into the policy level yeah. two things that we were kind of adding. One, equal weighting of the standards and the Howells at 5%, right? We felt like that was the first version. Right. Do you want to see the different. draft policy, Lou, now, or policy sure. committee? So this is yeah, the draft policy that that the policy committee put forward, right? I don't know if I'll one of the policy committee wants to present it. I'm not sure they put it forward. This okay. is where this is where <coughs> it currently is where it stands, stands okay. pending mm -hmm. further meetings. Got it. Um, so a real draft policy this time. Because as Lou described, it's interesting we're creating procedures and then kind of policy simultaneously in some ways. <laughs> and to address kind of like in the best point is like I don't think we wanted it to be like randomized across different classes. I mean, and, and maybe we end up getting there, but at least to start, we wanted students to understand coming in. This is what it means, and teachers to understand this is what it means relative to the weighting of the grade. I think that's the kind of systemization we're trying to get to. Then, like, but we don't want to stop like creative, you know, applications that are positive. What we're doing, but if we're going to have grading consistency, these are the kind of things we need to like identify. Right. So. I, I just want to add a, a, about this so far. I mean, I think this this is the recommendation coming from from Mary Beth and others in the administration, based on our this this is developed over time over three meetings or something like that. Um, we haven't really decided about how we're going to write the policy yet. I mean, it may be very similar to this. It may depart from this. We we had a really healthy conversation today about um, you know roles. the roles. Um, but you know us uh, from the board side having to understand the flexibility that's necessary um, to be in this policy so that we're not constricting the teachers and the administrators um, but then that the policy also has you know s uh, enough of a level of specificity that it's meaningful that it's not just so vague that it doesn't really hold anybody accountable to anything so I think we're still working out the kinks on that mm -hmm. but it's going well could I just make a suggestion on that? If mm -hmm. in a policy for it to say, instead of at a weighting of 5%, of at least 5%, mm -hmm. that gives some flexibility to. So, what we were trying to do there is, is that when this proficiency based learning and grading system first was brought in, once again, just go to 10 here. But um, one, of the, one of the reasons we were looking to change, where you were asking them why change or whatever, if everybody else is. And one of the things was is that what I heard from administration was is that we wanted to get a program that would kind of rein in some of the things. And there were classes that were saying, and, and just take English class for ninth grade, and it's the same class with but two teachers. And one was giving 10% to homework, and one was giving to 20% to homework. Okay? And, but yet it was the same class, and it would totally skew the, the grade. To the, I want to get into the, to the classroom that has a 20% teacher for homework, is, you know. And we actually had some teachers saying it was shocking to them that, you know, a child was able to pass with a, with a 60, but yet when you pulled away the howls, they were like, um, yeah, they really only had like a 45 or a 50 average, but because you gave them 20% for homework, it dragged it so far up there. So what we're trying to do here in the first year is make it that it's standard across. And if we say up to 5%, we're going to then have some teachers saying, I'm only going to, so I'm hearing people here saying maybe it should be higher than 5%, but if you say up to 5 then Would some teacher might come at up. Least at, least at least 5 At least 5 At least 5%. Five. Five. <laughs> well, then you're going to get right back to at least 5%. Some teacher is going to take that and say, it's 10%, and so it will be the same right. class. But I hear so we don't have to revise the policy, right? So, right. With the, with the, so the policy is written that way, but as far as how it's implemented is at, at the, the building level. So if, the, if we say that it's 5%, that's what it is. But I, I was thinking the same thing. We want to make sure we have a policy that doesn't have to be revised a lot. Right. right. If any year you decide that you want it to be 10%, then we don't want to come back to the table. It's just right. to vote on. I would expect to revise this policy. Like, <laughs> th that is not realistic to say we're going to get right. this right the first time. We're going to revise this policy. We're going to 
come to a deeper understanding of the procedures that support this policy. What we're trying to do though in year one, because there isn't a procedure that really like defines the hows in the minds of the students, to have it be up you know, 20, 30, 40% seem incre incredibly unfair. Year one, 5%, it may go higher, right? I mean, if you're in uh, a college class, in Pam's class, you get 25%. We talked about 10%. 10 and five are kind of the levels we talked about. But we felt like without having that underlying procedure identified and having a little more experience, making it more than five wasn't fair to the students coming in the door. Mm -hmm. So I think five weights it, but it doesn't overweight it at this point. And this will be retouched on over time. This is not a finished work product. Proficiency-based grading, I think we took a big step forward, is gonna take some time to get right. We should expect to rework on this policy. Anything else I don't think is realistic. Amelia? Sorry, Karen. <laughs> this is not, not a done job. <laughs> so. um, I was just gonna say, I, I mean, I'm all for the standards-based teaching and learning. I brought, I even brought Orly's report card, it's the elementary school report card, and I appreciate that I can look at the standards on it and see what she needs to work on, and I understand it. So I, I, I appreciate that very much. What I think that needs a little more thought maybe is how some of these procedures work in the school before we can really set policy on them. Because as a teacher, I look at something like house, which I'm not a teacher at this school, so I don't know how it works within these walls. I don't know how teachers subjectively now incorporate it and implement it into their every day and then based on that to say you're going to now have to weight this five percent i think that we just don't have enough information are you saying you want to see the procedure and the policy at the same time <coughs> no i'm saying i would like to talk to the teachers <laughs> and say how are you guys using this are we all using it the same way do we all understand it the same because I bet that not all the teachers are using it the same way. But this feedback came from the administration, right? That's so like fine. The, the point of view was and that yeah. and about the feedback teachers? that came from like yeah. Garen yeah. talking yeah. to yeah. teachers yeah. was that we wanted included in the grade. So, okay. so basically what we're yeah. doing is in alignment with the recommendations of the administration and I'm assuming the teachers. Okay. Um, <laughs> we just wanted to make sure that until the, poli the procedures are clearly laid out beneath them, like 5% was kind of where that number was. In the future it may change. But right. exactly so I think what that's your concern been is, is why we wanted to not make it 10% because we want to make sure that we get it to where it's uniform and everyone mm -hmm. understands okay. it the same. That's so maybe we should roll this meeting back an hour and 25 minutes ago and start off with saying that <laughs> we asked this question <laughs> earlier today, who put this stuff together? Yeah, and well. Garen and right. there were around seven teachers, Raf, you were saying, that, that, that put this and okay. suggested that and they really wanted to see the howls in and mm -hmm. I think that I think at the number that we were given at that time was was 10 percent but then when we got into the conversation it was <coughs> like we still have to build what's actually in there and mm -hmm. instead of the grading for the student of going at 10 yeah. you know we, we kind of lowered it down yeah no five. I appreciate that because I did not have that information so I right so that. yeah no but this is I not three so people from this okay. side of the table, we, we really have been working with and listening to what they've come to us with. That's All right, Jen. I just wanted to, to um, you know, um, uh, well, the one word I'm looking for, I, I want to tell you it's going to be okay, because I, I don't know what that <laughs> word is. What is that word? What is that word? What that word is, but it's going to be, um, having, having, you know, a, a middle school student and, and a ninth grader, I do think that the middle school teachers in particular do a good job, and I, I think this, the seventh grade, both, both teams, the seventh and eighth grade team, do a good job in really teaching as a team, and because there is just one teacher for each, you know, um, other than foreign language. So they really teach those kids, it has been my experience, <coughs> what is expected in the, you know, perseverance, participation, um, preparation and whatever it is. Um, they really, the kids know, and I feel that those teams are very unified in what their expectations are. I don't know that that's true in high school, but I think that at least in seventh and eighth grade, they've gotten that message. You know, they, they ha go through these teams for one year where they really teach as a team and they do have these, you know, um, assemblies where they talk about what the expectations are in the summer. You get you know, packets that say what the how you know what the howls are. So I don't think these kids come and and they're like, 
the first report card, they're like, oh my, I didn't know I was going to be graded on that. Like, right. that's very clear. I'm not worried about the kids. Well, no, and so, but I, <laughs> 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 but, I'm, I'm but I might be, if I, if I didn't have kids who were here, I might be like, well, how would the kids know? I do yeah. think that they know. And then I think they're sort of trained. It, I, I think the seventh and eighth grade teams have pretty homogeneous expectations and the way in which they administer the howls and grade for the howls. I, I don't know if that's true for the high school yet. You know, I'm still waiting to no, see. But I, I'm glad you brought that up because I think, I mean, kids, they learn, they're adjust, they adjust right. really and well. They and habits, it's really up right, to yeah. the teachers and everybody else to show them the way and explain to them and roll out these new programs and that's doable so i'm not worried about that well and, and in fact this year it's my understanding here and that they did um like the honor roll a bit differently uh, in the seventh grade at least i don't know if it was in the eighth grade where um the howls were the basis for the honor roll you know and so you're really um encouraging you know the kids are shown that this is a you know, really high priority, and your your persistence, your person, you know, your preparation, your participation. These are all so important that we're going to, you know, give, um, you know, we're going to commend you for these and that assembly kind of things. So I, I think I can speak for, which is kind of exciting. We've got a unanimous support, I believe, in this room of the importance of Howells and how hard it is to do it well, and the teachers are doing the exact same thing. So as far as this understanding that this is really important and it's going to take some really good work, um, is a good place to be. And we kind of know that that work to go on. So, um, so this is, this is the, similar to the conversation that I had with the teachers, which is, again, well, this is important, we want to do it, now we've got to step up to the plate and really do it well. So and it's some work. Yeah. Um, I guess my, my thought is I'm, I'm curious as to why we wouldn't attach some of these procedures to our policy um, in the sense so that we can, so that everybody's on the same page, so that the translation from teacher to parent to student is consistent. Um, and I don't mean we have to get into the weeds of it, I'm just talking about um, I, I liked your triangle, you know, where you have That's your... That's all you liked? The triangle? <laughs> I haven't finished my conversation, <laughs> thank you. I, you know, but with the um, transcript to a report card to assessments, um, and then how those are basically uh, graded out or, or established so that people understand what the process is. Um, I, I just think it, it would benefit us to have some procedures attached to this particular policy um, so that there is real clarity um, with all of the stakeholders involved of the expectations within this policy. I think that's I'd like exactly to speak to that. Doing, I mean, that's what I was yeah. pushing for today in conversation. Um, I, think, uh, I think there's some concerns about flexibility, but um, I think we landed in a place where we agreed. It was your suggestion, Lou, right, about... Um, yeah, well, I think the way that we yeah. left it, it, it Thank you. and I think it addresses some version of your <coughs> concern, Paige, mm -hmm. is that we want the procedures clearly spelled out and kind of universal, right? And, and so that's what the administration is charged with coming back to, with, with come back to us with in four areas that support um, proficiency-based grading. Do we want to vote them into policy? We decided not to do that because we wanted to keep enough flexibility so that as we get into this, those procedures can be adjusted, but with full knowledge of the policy committee and the board. So that's something you should expect to see is like the underlying procedure is really clear, not an undefined procedure, but something that has clarity like timeliness of putting in grades, you know, what are the time frames, right? That's the next step in the process, right? Okay. So. And that was a big conversation for probably half hour today on that, and I was really pushing for um, saying it needs to be in policy, these things here. And then it made sense when Mary Beth and um, Richard were talking, and then also Lou kicked in, that, you know, like just saying it's policy, policy, <coughs> policy, it's going to be in the handbook as a procedure, and I kept on pushing that, like the dates, the amount of days for a teacher to put into a, a grade book, it's gonna have to be in that handbook. So then the student can can hold the teacher account.
just like we want to hold the students, we want to hold the teachers and the staff accountable. And then at the same, but we're not going to put it into policy. We're going to give it this procedure place first, okay? If we start finding out that it's not happening on that basis, as Lou kept on saying, well, then we're going to come in here on policy and we're going to start putting it there. I don't really see a difference, like walking away from that meeting today and taking my drive back home, much difference between policy and procedure and the handbook. I mean, once it's written in there, then that, that, that's what the kids are going to go by. We could call it policy. We could call it procedure. We could call it rules. But it's going to be in that book, and that book is going to be printed before the school year starts, and we're all going to see it. So what I'm looking for, in what I was looking for to get written in stone in a policy that's going to change, okay, they're going to have it in a handbook, and it's going to be the procedure. And that handbook is not just the handbook for procedure for the students. It's also for the teachers to follow that guideline. I think to, to, to Jim's point, like, when we write this right now, I don't think we can effectively write it in stone yet. We don't have enough experience with how these underlying pieces are going to work. We need to write it, but still have an eraser. Putting it in policy makes it very hard to make changes, you know, but you know, putting it in procedure creates that opportunity for administration to do that. So the way that we left it was this. You know, if you put it in procedure, it's really clearly defined, and it's going well, you're good. We don't need to put it in policy. If it's not going well, then it goes into policy, right? And that creates some more restrictions. And I think that's a fair expectation between a board and an administration on how we operate. I guess the last thing about it is that even though I did want a lot of detail in the, um, in the thing, really we have to be careful that we don't put so much in because then it doesn't make sense anymore. Then we're like, we have oversight over our own ideas. That doesn't make sense. So we have to put the big goals in there and let the administration and the teachers do their jobs. So. Exactly. Sorry. With the procedures that are going to be written in and they're going to be followed. Yeah, they're going to be there. Bryce had his hand up first. Yeah. Uh, I just was going to say I actually would value the flexibility. I would think and hope that we um, would follow through with, again, maybe surveying parents and stuff, and, and that may happen halfway through a school year, and it might be nice to be able to make those adjustments. At the same time, if that's the case, something like that might want to be built into policy is how um, how the, the procedures are going to be monitored and evaluated. That's good that, point. To, that's to me, good that point. feels like something I think could be built, built into policy. policy. And, and that's fine for the procedures to be in the handbook, but I would want some sort of, you know, we're going to, if we sign off on this policy, I want there to be some mechanism for reporting back to the board right. if procedures are changing, you know, I mean, if there is. Um, well, let's make this clear that this is a draft, and we have not come. Yeah. 100% on this. Well, I think we could add that. And we're we taking could, this feedback loop recommendations. Could be added right. And, so and, and, that, and, and <coughs> here's one good one, and there's another good one on that. And that's one of the biggest things that I'm like afraid of in procedure. I want to see if a procedure gets changed, but it does come back to the board. And did, Mary Beth, didn't you say that the procedures could be done by the fall? They'll have to be oh, in yeah, order yeah, to yeah. implement yeah. Right. Uh, for the fall. Yeah. yeah. So those are, you know, so there's going to, you know, and we're trying, one of the things that we've talked to you about is to try to be honest about what we feel like we can implement by the fall and where we think we're going to need more time. Um, but in terms of me, the, most of the procedures that we're talking about here, I would say certainly the Howells are going to need more time to unpack. The teachers are really going to have to spend some time in dialogue around that. But I think most of the other ones we should be able to have in place by the bond in the handbook. And they'll come to the policy committee first for us to look over. Which is why I don't think we can view this as a done process, right? Like th this is this is a partnership between the teachers, the administration, and the board, right? To create this and then students to understand it and participate. It's going to take some time, and hence that's why we think this is the most prudent approach. Over time, we may decide different things depending upon how it's going, but we think, like, as a first step, this is the way to handle it. I do like the idea of building in a feedback loop into the policy, though. I think that's probably a good idea. Um, yeah, and on that feedback loop you know, issue, I look at the information we got from this parent and student survey. I mean, it's changed everything about how we've looked at this. 
Um, I, you know, I think it'd be great that we follow up with that as this is implemented. I would love to see a teacher survey similarly extended to all teachers. Oh, yeah. um, you know, the seven I'm sure are very representative, but it would be nice to get every teacher's feedback about how easy this is to implement. How much do I think this reflects really what my students are doing? You know, um, how much you know time is this taking away from educating? It, I would really appreciate that that piece of information would be really helpful going okay. forward as well. Got it. Well, it also has kind of enhances educating. Right. right, exactly, so anyway, yes, yep. I, I do think that's an, we, we, we need to survey all of the different stakeholders mm -hmm. that participate mm -hmm. in this, except for the policy committee, because there's three of us and you hear from us all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Surveying us would be meaningless. I mean, I look at it and seem like we, we're coming out and say we're gonna come up with a survey in November 20th, the answer is November 25th, and that's gonna be after the first report card. But I mean, there needs to be one, like you said, from the teachers, from the, Back from the students, back from the parents, okay, and administration, because you're not teachers or whatever, okay, and coming and seeing how it's working and going from there. But there needs to be, since this is, I'm looking at this as being finally a pilot program that we've got a grasp on and moving forward and trying to re not regulate things, but making it work better. And I think we should be having one of these reports at the end of each report card for this next year. You may say, why? And because the way I look at it is, is that once again, that first report card, I don't know, might only be worth 8%. Nobody really understands it. And then when it comes to the third one, well, wait a second, what I understood in the first, I thought that was my kid's grade. Yeah, the, yeah at that so point, it was 100% of your grade, but now it's so only So let's work on the grade. feedback loop. And then the other thing I would ask procedurally, Mary Beth, is, and Garen, can you give us a date by which we're going to see the procedures spelled out more clearly? There's four clear procedures that we want. I'd like to work on a deadline on that rather than just have go forever because we have to make it understood to teachers and students before the next school year so it can be built into things like a handbook and that sort of thing. So can you come back to us with here's a date that these will be, you know, put together, right? And, and just to make sure you know the, the time frame for grade input updates, the procedures for makeup work or missed work, yep. the Howells assessment, and then this question about retakes. Are those the four things? That's correct. Yeah, that's exactly <coughs> it. Okay. Yeah. And, and so four procedures that are kind of spelled out with some specificity so that we can, you know, feel confident in presenting this to the community that, you know, that system's in place. Then we get to monitor it and figure out, you know, over time what goes to policy, what stays in procedure based upon success. And I think that is a formula where everybody gets some flexibility and some accountability. Okay. On, on the accountability piece, um, just another thing, I guess, because this is such a procedurally heavy topic compared to some policies that are really black and white, uh, just as another check and balance, uh, maybe if there's going to be changes made to the policy, something's built in about notice given mm -hmm. timelines and stuff. Um, so if there's any major changes to reporting and stuff to parents, that there's X oh. amount of time, given that it starts to be in school year or some, I don't, I don't yeah. know what it would look like, but just, again, I, I, I've been trying to think lately about, and, and a lot of our policies this first year were really black and white, but with like a lot of new board members and stuff, sometimes it's hard to, to I'm trying to put myself in their shoes. So if two years from now we have a whole new board, um, just being really careful, making sure we have things like this built in so they're getting these reports, whether it's annually or mm -hmm. whatever, from the administration, and it's just offered to them willingly without them having to go back and see like, well, policies have been passed over the last two years and trying to, trying to catch up if they know, oh, in June it looks like we're getting a report on this because this policy says they have to. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that offers more to the future boards. But I think we should be hopeful because the hardest part of this project is done, and that's the rubric that under a lot of the standards, mm -hmm. right? And now it's a matter of getting them on in, but creating those is like a mammoth task. Mm -hmm. So the fact that that's done, I think we have a chance to succeed here if we can kind of build it out in the right way and be very like conscientious and open to change on that. So, so it's June so it 3rd. What would be a good time to say that we can have those four things shot? For them just to go through yeah. on people's schedules and all the things and come back in the next five days? Because there's a lot of stuff going on over the next right. few weeks. Be sure we've got availability of the right personnel. Be back to you in the next day. So, so, so basically, school starts when in August next year, this year. The next, next year, when does school start? First day of school. August 23rd. So no, 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 the teacher start. Oh, the kid the teachers are back. I'm asking the administration. My kids will tell me when school starts. So the 28th of August. So when do you have to go to print to have a handbook ready for the kids to go to school? 
We would go to print at the end of June, probably. Okay. <coughs> so the end of June, you're going to go to print. That's this month. So, <laughs> so basically, before you go to print, you need to call the, sub, the, the subcommittee of the policy or the full board together to approve what's going to be put in on this grading system, okay, in that handbook. That's what we're saying here. Measure the electronic version that they have a different print date. Don't as, lo as, long as, as long as you have, as long as you have in front of us, yeah. say the third week of June, if you're going to go to print, yeah. be, you know, because we may, if you go to print before and we may wipe something out, you're going to print again. Yep. But I think with procedure, we don't have to approve like all the procedures, right? That that's getting too far. But what we want to see, we to make us comfortable that we want to stand pat on where policy is. Mm -hmm. We want to see specific procedures. I don't think right. this is a matter of like and we can talk offline about this, of completely approving every procedure. I'm talking about these four items. That's, that's what right. I mean too, right? Yeah. These four items that are procedures, we're not putting to the policy level because we don't want to actually confine that right now. What we want to do is say, all right, come up with procedures, show us something specific put it into the handbook for right now, and we won't put it up into the policy level right now because that gives you more flexibility. I, I think that's the trade-off, right? And I think I'm going to be disagreeing with that. Yeah. You can always amend with them. Me I think you're here. I mean, right. you is that, that, yeah. that if you come back in and say that the teachers, <laughs> the teachers can't, the teachers have 30 days from the one the test is or whatever, we wanted a reasonable amount of time. That's well, what I'm looking for. But we'll have a chance to give that feedback, yeah. right? As part of like, give this to us before right. this is going to go out. I'm just saying, like, I don't think there's a formal approval. I think there's a feedback loop. If you get to where we're not comfortable, then it goes to a policy with a formal approval. Uh, you, could call, you could call it feedback, and I could call it approval. But they should necessarily create well, the Well, I just mean, like, technically yeah. on a board, though. I think technically, look, we're working together. Uh, technically, we are accepting feedback mm -hmm. and, and learning what's, what works and then putting it in. And then it kind of is in the reverse for, the, for other. We're going to provide you feedback. But mm -hmm. it's your thing. That's what I think. So. No, I, th I think we're on the right. I think we're saying about the same thing. Mm -hmm. You're semanticizing. But like everything our committee does, <laughs> talk about it for 30 minutes. <laughs> so we'll see it before it goes to front. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. Now, does that mean that we all get to see it, or you three see it? We. Anybody who comes to the... No, 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 no. This will go out to Listen, everybody. At 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I am not free. Neither am I. Yeah, I'm not really either, but... Um, yeah, I'm not No, but you're saying that we'll bring it to the whole board? <laughs> We're going to get a copy, I'm going to send I mean, it this, out. I think, gets to the, the distinction between policy and procedure, exactly. right? We're going to need a lot of flexibility mm -hmm. to pull this off. Yeah. Right, and if, if we're boxed in in terms of you may only do this, once it gets into policy, that's what. Well, then I'm going to stop you right there because what I specifically said in this meeting today was I want to specifically see when a teacher has to have something in a grade book, mm -hmm. how long from there that a student has to, and ha has to have time to make up whatever howls work that they didn't in order to take that test over. Yeah, and I'm not saying that we're not right. going to do that, but what I'm what I'm saying is in terms of bringing it to the board and bringing it for a policy vote, right. you know, Garen's right. going to sit, he's going to talk with his leadership team, he's going to put the teachers together, and we're going to figure out what is, a, what is a reasonable procedure. I mean, I think we've had been enough in conversation right. that we have an understanding of what the community wants. You've given us right. some really good feedback, and we're going right. to come back to you with what I would assume would be reasonable procedures for you to follow. Um, but in terms of like then trying to get the board back together and vote on that, the board isn't going to vote on your procedures. Right. Right. That's the, I guess it's that's the distinction. Policy, I'm trying right? to that's make the important difference here. Yeah, it's a it's a very very tight time frame to pull this off. Well, it's four uh, years, really. It's I, I know, but what, what, what would, 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 would you like to add? There's a lot. Well, I, I just I think I think there's an understanding of what's being requested. And I, no one's asking for 30 days. You know, they're looking for something where you, you need feedback to the students. And ultimately, I, I think it's there. Mm -hmm. Why don't we give Garen and his team a chance? And you know, I, 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 I think it was there three years ago. No, no, no. I understand that, but we're in a different place than we were three years ago, and the conversation was different. So, I'm just, I'm just proposing that we're going around the same topic. And I think that I think I, I think Garen heard it and and, and can carry this one. I have Elena. I just want to say one last thing is that if we go into policy this way, whether with students or with teachers, we have to remember that if you're going to say come back with reporting grades every two weeks, 
and you're putting that in policy, and if teacher doesn't, then there also has to be the other side of that. You bet. So let's remember that for students, for teachers, for everything. That's all. One good reason to start with procedure, get yeah. buy-in, system understanding, work on the procedures. Give Jim, I agree with you. We want to see those specifics. We don't necessarily want to approve them yet as a policy. We'll approve the big ideas as a policy. Let the procedures work themselves out. If it's not working out and you know we don't feel like it's that the mandate's being followed, then we basically give to the administration a policy that they can also use to implement this, right? Like this isn't all just like you know, negative. I mean, this is like no, this is a process we're trying to work I'm through. I'm not so looking that, you know. to take procedure and make it the policy. I'm saying I want to mm -hmm. see the procedures and give the feedback if for some reason it is 30 or 45 days Before out. Before it goes to print. That's all. Okay. okay. I want to see and then give feedback on the procedure. That's all. Send Go ahead, Claire. Send it to Jim. I was just wondering when we're actually voting on the purpose on the grading policy. They have to do a first read first, so okay. they have to bring their first read to the full board. Okay. And I don't know when that timing will be. So we probably want to vote it on this until September then? Not necessarily. If, if we get a first read on June 10th, which is a possibility, we may call a special meeting before the end of June so that it can be set into policy. Okay. That makes sense. I think that's a reasonable expectation. I think we're and you're the keeper of the policy. Like, I, I think <laughs> that it would, it would I think we're close, to, right? to put it into policy before the end of June versus waiting until September, correct? Yes. Yeah, I mean, because then you guys can get I think we can, you know, there's a mechanism by yeah. which we do that. I, you know, one of the things that we may think about um, with the board, I know a lot of people are traveling. This has been a pretty intensive month so far. So if there is, you know, strong support for it on June 10th, maybe, maybe we just need a quorum to come here and... Mm -hmm. um, well, and today's June 3rd, and we made it clear today that we want more than just that, correct? I mean, there's those two in there. We still wanted a little bit more than that, correct? A little bit more. A little bit more. So, so once again, now you're talking about next Monday, and we already have trying to put together school closure and um, restructuring. restructuring. I mean, just, just. I mean, I don't know how many other people here are on subcommittees, but, but this, this, yeah, this, 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 twice this, a week now. Th 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 this, this subcommittee has been meeting quite a bit. <laughs> I'm sure some of the others might have been too, maybe. In could, could I just offer, one of the things we talked about last meeting, the reason we were talking about this is because we, we kind of made it clear that we either wanted to uh, potentially forge forward with the hybrid model or just revert back to the old-fashioned way, maybe without, even though the policy's not done, maybe just, even if it's unofficial vote, being able to give administration guidance and say, obviously it sounds like we're all in support of this, or no, yeah. we really think we just want to revert back. Um, I would say this, the policy is close. I don't think the panel is close. It is, it is close. I do, I do think the Monday first read is, do, is doable. Yeah. Yeah, I think. So I think we should shoot for that and then have a little board vote on that. Friday. Yeah. We're meeting Friday. No, not, not you guys. <laughs> we, could, we could discuss <laughs> it for 10, 15 minutes <laughs> max. Yes. Okay. And just if we can get the wording of the policy and just focus on that for now and forget the procedures for that vote, I think we're good to move on. We can do that. We'll try We can do that. That's our plan. So when are we meeting for 15 minutes? That I think I'm not going to write okay. <laughs> no, we're having yeah, a meeting we anyway. The, on Friday the 7th at 8.30. Oh, okay. So our agenda will be 8.30 to 8.45. This yes. subject, and then we'll move to the work. others. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. have lots of free time. No, we don't. No, we really don't. Do no. I have any We more really questions? care. No. Okay. <laughs> I have a motion on the table to end the meeting, please. So we'll so move. Second. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.